today's presentation is by Gary Hamlin, the inadvertent archivist, who uh, is retiring for the second time from UC Berkeley. Like, don't, don't pick up this tablet. Uh, you know, don't make it a tablet. And uh, for the last years, he's been working closely with us in reorganizing the archives and library holdings of the Magnus, uh, what we call the Global Jewish Diaspora Collections. Uh, these were materials that were collected either all over the world or very much in the Bay Area for over 50 years with a sense of urgency of saving what was felt was going to be lost if it was not preserved in a museum in a collection setting. Uh, the urgency was so urgent that it kind of trumped a systematic documentation of the materials that were being collected. So there are treasures, as we will see, there are treasures in this collection that still need to be researched. And a lot of the work that we've been doing with Gary over these years is also researching the provenance of these materials, understanding how they came to be in Berkeley, how they came to be part of the Magnus collection. And then, of course, together and, and really banking on his expertise, and, and I'm not going to say how many decades, but of uh, work in the UC Berkeley library system, uh, also in thinking very hard about how to give access to these materials and what to do with them, how to turn these treasures into research resources. So it's my pleasure, honor, to welcome my friend and colleague Gary Hanson to the pop-up exhibition series, The Inadvertent Archivist. Thank you, Gary. with 
cardboard box, and in those cardboard boxes were Yiddish books, both firm and sort of heartbreakingly infirm. There were uh, scrapbooks and newspaper clippings. There were art books, and there were kid books, kids' books, uh, which I found sort of weird at the time, including a blast from my past, I swear. At the bottom of one of these boxes, I found picture stories from the Bible. Now, for me, picture stories from the Bible, I had a great uncle of Herschel, who was sweet but clueless, very religious guy, who used to give me things like this for my birthday. This is just what a, a six-year-old wants. It's a classic illustrated Bible. But in any case, by the way, this is the, this is the same guy that every year, because my sister Joyce's birthday is in October and falls next to Sukkot, every year he would give her an ephraim. Now, if you want to see the personification of disappointment, you should look at the face of a six-year-old who's been given a lemon-like thing for her birthday. Anyway, so I, I found this. Oops. Yes? So the story of the Bible, I can't quite explain. I'm not familiar with it. Is it the Jewish Bible? Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's the Pentateuch, Old the Old Testament. Oh, exactly. it says the Old Testament. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. And I still have my copy somewhere in the, in the, in the Hamden archives. <laughs> so, um, you know, in retrospect, I realized this was only about nine years after the madness had moved into Russell Street. And it was still a collection that was definitely in the process of becoming of figuring out what it had and what to do uh, with what it had. Well, did I, you know, did I get anything of use for my bibliography? No, I got nothing of use. But I did come away with something that was sort of even more important for a kind of fledgling librarian, such as I was, which was a kind of sudden blast of illumination, a satori. And I realized for the first time, I think, that without cataloging and classification, a, a collection, no matter how brilliant and wonderful the collection is, is useful to um, researchers and students and anyone else. If you can't find what you got, it doesn't matter. The other thing is, without preservation and storage, um, even the, the most wonderful collection in the world uh, stands a good chance of going away forever. And for a collection such as the Magnuses, which a lot of which has come through the flames of history, that's particularly ironic and sad. Okay, so let's fast forward a couple of years. I get my MLS, I work in corporate libraries for a couple of years, and in 1979 I get a job at the UC Berkeley Library. I work at the Berkeley Library for 35 years in various departments, and I retire. How's that for a encapsulated <laughs> So I retired in 2012. Now, through a weird conjunction of stars and my dear wife's incessant pushing, I learned about a job. This is about a week before I retired. I learned about a part-time job at the Madness. The job has a very intriguing sounding title. It's called Public Services Coordinator and a completely fuzzy job description. Um, it's, it's not really I don't, it's a job in search of a, a job description, basically. But in any case, I apply, I interview the day after I retire, and I get the job, and I come to work here. Now, this notion of public services coordinator in itself is sort of theoretically what the public services coordinator was supposed to do, and does, in fact, is link um, the public, researchers, students, faculty, um, with collections. Now that in itself is a sort of radical idea. It's not something that happens in every museum. Uh, it acknowledges the fact that a collection can be a living, vital resource uh, for research and study, and not just um, a bunch of cool stuff that's embalmed in um, climate-controlled storage or that is periodically schlepped out and exhibited. It can be a kind of living artifact, and I think that's one of the one of the really glories of this place is that it the collection is in play, in intellectual play, um, an amazing thing. So um, 
I was here for about three months, and as I recall, Francesco and I happened to have a, a couple of really interesting conversations in that time period, and he, um, you know, basically took me deeper into the parts of the collection, including the part of the collection that lives in that side of the building. And if you walk out up here and look to your right, you'll see the archival part of this. Um, archival is a, is a sort of interesting misnomer in a way. I'll, I'll talk about what that is in a second. But um, um, we talked about the fact that this collection had been sort of miraculously transported from Russell Street and put into at least workable order here, which uh, I, I don't think I could express how currently in a task that was. So the collections that he showed me um, were in rough but not perfect order. Um, and what those collections comprised, the ones that we talked about specifically, uh, really included a, a, a wide variety of things. Um, first of all, you have to realize that when we moved to this building, is that me? <laughs> Every, I love how these things ring. Everybody sort of. Um, when the Magnus moved, in fact, the part of the collection that had been the Western Jewish Historical Center Archives, uh, which was a, a collection of family papers and other documents having to do with Jews in the American West, uh, some books, right, books as well, some photographic materials, went to the Bancroft Library, which is the great Western Americana collection in, in probably the United States. Um, the art and artifacts, uh, in the Magnus collection came here. And that was miraculous because a lot of the stuff had been in storage previously, was hauled out, and finally given a home under one roof. Quite amazing. The third part of this collection um, was a kind of hard to describe amalgam of a lot of different kinds of uh, materials, lots of different genres of, materi of materials. And I wanted to talk about those a little bit, just uh, briefly, to show you the kinds of stuff that, um, that I've been dealing with. Um, there is a large, there are a large number of family archives that are invaluable for sort of mapping the trajectory of the Jewish diaspora around the world. Um, the stuff that came here, I think, can be characterized as having largely to do with uh, Jews outside of the United States, but there's a, there's a kind of mix. Uh, this is from a, a, a family archive, the Reich family, that um, uh, my colleague Barbara is uh, working on right now. Um, so there are family archives. We have a small but really interesting um, collection of rare books. This, if I'm not mistaken, you can correct me. Um, I think is the oldest thing we have, which is a really interesting first edition of the Bible published by uh, a guy who's a French royal printer, um, uh, Robert Etienne. Uh, this particular Bible was published in 1544, there were earlier um, editions. Uh, but um, you can take a look at this little thing here. It's quite amazing. The other thing that's interesting about this that we sort of discovered in looking at it is it's got a what looks at first glance to be the title page of this Bible. That's um, Etienne's printer's device right up there, that olive, can't really see it well, olive tree with a serpent wrapped around it. But if you look at it more closely, it, it in fact is a kind of mystery, it's a kind of trace reproduction of the title page. Where the ri original title page went, anyway. Uh, we have a, a really cool Haggadah collection that ranges from the, the earliest that we have in this collection, 1803-4, to the groovy Santa Cruz Haggadah, which I really love. It's got sort of Mr. Natural levitating above the, the air there. Another, um, um, I'm particularly fond of the revisionist Haggadahs that we have, the, the Haggadahs that have been repurposed um, into sort of different kinds of modern liberation um, narratives like this fourth world that got over here. Very cool. Ah, this is one of my favorites. So um, we also have a, a large mixed 
audio and visual collection, you can see the swanky uh, filing uh, scheme we have here for a lot of it. This is something we're going to have to deal with a little bit. But the, the collection, oh, Gary, what have you done? Oh my gosh. No. Talk among yourself.
Some of this has been digitized, uh, as this has, and put up on the Internet Archive. So if you go to the Internet Archive and put in Magnus, you can get a list of both the oral histories we've done, audio oral histories, and the video stuff. Home movies are big deals now. You know, what used to be relegated to the back of the closet are now being used by cultural historians because you know, if you look around the frame carefully, you can get really interesting evidence of what the cultural center of the time was, and architecture and clothing was like. Photographs, as I mentioned, a large number of our photographs went to the, the Bangkok, but we still have a fairly large and interesting collection which really spans a huge amount of territory, everything from historic photographs of Middle Eastern subjects to lots of stuff that was taken for the um, Joint Distribution Committee, American Joint Distribution Committee, a, a relief organization. Lots of family. Um, this is actually the family of um, the grandparents of a woman who used to be a, a principal curator here, Ruth Ice. Um, really interesting stuff. And I don't know where that, do you know where that fence photo is? Where that fence photo is found? Part of the chair was collected in Morocco in the 1970s by Magnus. By Magnus, yeah. Okay, so this is my personal picture. The other part of this collection, the other thing to find in this collection, is what librarians and archivists call ephemera. Now, ephemera is a kind of broad-ranging term, usually for paper stuff, small scraps of evidence and history that were, you know, never really meant to survive the test of time. Stuff that wasn't meant, you know, to stick around for, for a large amount of time. So, what we're talking about are things like newspaper clippings, um, Postcards, um, uh, is Zoe's not here today. Another one of our URAP students was involved in digitizing and inventorying these. I love this postcard collection for its uh, uh, craziness to some extent, and its scope and its weird surrealism. I mean, uh, shut it home with a, a woman in an airplane. It's kind of, you know, it's kind of Jewish surrealism, is what it, what it really is. It's a large collection of um, anti-Semitic postcards. This is actually my favorite, my favorite, the Vista Matzo photo. Who would have said that it's anybody? It's not exactly anti-Semitic, you know, maybe, who, who knows? Uh, Handbells, flyers, posters, these are two of my favorites. One of the headlands meeting is uh, of this case welcome to take a look after, um, after the talk. The other one is for uh, advertising Upton Sinclair, who was a socialist who ran as Democratic uh, candidate for governor in California and lost resoundingly. It had a program called End Poverty in California, um, uh, which was a kind of interesting uh, early reform uh, movement. Um, what he was doing in New York, something around with anybody's death, unless they couldn't get anybody else out there. Hard to, hard to know. So, um, as Francesco and I talked more and more about this stuff, it sort of became apparent that, um, you know, with my, my background in archives and libraries, uh, it was possible that I could lend a hand in bringing some order to this stuff. And that's sort of what I've been doing for the last four years. Um, going bo box by box into this collection, um, uh, trying to build on existing inventories and catalogs. And I've got to say that uh, every day that I worked with this collection, I was amazed at what had been done already to bring order and sense to this, as well as what was left um, to be done. Um, each of these boxes is a kind of Pandora's box that holds like incredible wonders and also incredible frustrations. And 
one of the, the most amazing parts of this job has been just holding this stuff in the hand. I mean, it's hard to um, it's it's hard to overemphasize how emotional it is to hold a scrap of paper in one's hand that should have never really survived the test of history in the first place and is a kind of really moving evidence of, of oftentimes a gone life. So, you know, all of this stuff, when you look at it, um, you know, holds a, holds a huge emotional wall up. Um, let's see, how am I doing with this? Uh-oh, so I kind of want to move things along here. Oh, the other thing I was going to mention, the other thing in this collection, which is sort of interesting, which I've actually discovered sort of late, are sort of haphazard institutional archives. Magnus wasn't really good about, um, it was good about saving stuff. It wasn't necessarily great about organizing stuff. And oh yeah, here's more of them. Anyway, that's an issue. These are um, Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah tickets for um, the Shanghai uh, community, Jewish community in Shanghai in the, in the 30s. This is a, sort of an example. We've got a real panoply of stuff. We've got uh, Max Eisen's uh, union card. We've got a certificate of shares for a fundraising drive uh, for Israel. Um, this over in the corner there is a newsletter produced by the Jewish community in Tourettean, in the Tourettean Shtat concentration camp. Um, and we may be the only holders of this set of stuff in the world. All of this stuff you have to do more research on, but it's a very rare thing. And again, the fact that it survived the Holocaust is pretty incredible. Okay, the other thing I was going to say are these institutional archives. Here's an example. This is a, a note from a, a guy named uh, Bernie Kimmel, Rabbi Bernie Kimmel, who was sent by the Magnus in the late 60s. Stop. To celebrate Gary's last day. <laughs> that is really bad for. <laughs> um, anyways, Kimmel was sent over to the, the community of uh, Cochin, India, um, on the, the west coast of India, to try to um, rescue material. The, the, the term rescue mission was used a lot uh, for dealing with vanishing or vanished communities trying to bring back um, uh, remaining, remaining evidence of this community. So this is a, a note from, from Kimmel uh, uh, to Seymour Fromer, the, the founder of Magnus, talking about um, various matters having to do with acquiring material in the India. The interesting stuff about this is a lot of times, um, even when the, when the thread the provenance of certain things in this collection are lost. Um, sometimes institutional archives like this can give you a clue about the origins of where they came from. Um, Julie just found a really interesting piece of evidence which cast light on a kind of mysterious artifact we had in our collection for a long time, a, a Torah scroll that was supposedly saved from crystal knock. Uh, but it turned out not to be anything, any such thing. But it was, was it Lou Weiss's archive, or did you find this? Yeah. yeah, so it was a curator's archive that is digging down into the layers of, of material that um, actually told us what this mystery item uh, was. Okay. Um, okay, the other thing about you know, a lot of things in this collection is that, um, well, no, I'll, I'll back up. Um, an example of trying to put things back together again is um, the case of a, of a woman named, oh, seems to be better at this, um, Martha Rindler. So, um, in the stacks, there are about 25 boxes simply labeled Holocaust ephemeral. And those boxes include a whole bunch of stuff. They include newspaper clippings of the Nuremberg trial. They include photographic reproductions. They include visitors' guides to concentration camps, anti-Semitic propaganda, 
sort of orphaned, um, uh, orphaned uh, passports for Jews who had gotten out of camps, a uh, whole array, array of things. None of it organized very well in catalogs or whatever. Well, in about five or six of these boxes, there were documents that looked like they had come from a family named Rindler, uh, a woman named Martha Bubach, who married a guy named Carl Rindler, um, and had been uh, sent to Theresienstadt in uh, Theresien in about 1942. They were, these documents were splattered out all over these boxes. Some of them had catalog, uh, some of them had accession numbers, which means we logged them in when they came in. A great many did not. None of the stuff is in the catalog. So the trick was to put that puzzle back together again. Now, one of the things, we, we knew a tiny bit about, about Ms. Rindler, Rubat Rindler, uh, but only as much as the, the gift. When this thing came in, um, we knew that she lived in Oakland, and we had a sort of partial list of the things that she had donated, but not a complete list. So the trick was to put all of that stuff together to try to, to backtrack and make sense of what this collection was all about. I think just recently, Julie actually found in a completely different part of the collection a mystery box that had yet more of it. So over the years, this integral collection, it's really important to keep this stuff together to get a sense of what the material is about and where it comes from, had been flung to the winds and now we've been working at you know, putting it back together. So these are a few things. I, the most, one of the most, in the four years that I've been here, this is one of the most incredible things that I've come across. In, in the Terrickson uh, camp, uh, Terrickson camp was sort of famous for mounting musical productions. And the most famous of these is Brundabar, which has been put on, put on my book. But there was a lot of um, both clandestine and vaguely sanctioned cabaret that went on in Barrett and other places. This is a program of, uh, of a cabaret sort of operetta by um, uh, Kurt Klavner and Otto Beer that uh, we found in the Gubach uh, collection. This, as far as I can see, is the only so it's, it's pretty amazing. Again, I'll have to do a little bit more research, but I looked very hard and did not find anybody else to hold. Pretty amazing thing. These are, these are a few um, other regular things. This is sort of one of the most poignant up here. Um, this is, uh, Terrence was liberated in 45, and this is uh, May 45. This is um, July 45 allowing her to upgrade from brown bread to white bread. So um, uh, Barbara Goldstein and I have talked about this. It looks apparently as if Martha stayed in Terrison. Terrison had probably was turned, the, the Red Cross moved in and sort of turned this into a quasi um, displaced persons camp. And that's probably what this happened. But you know, you can see it's amazing that anyone survived. Um, it's a receipt for the repair of a wristwatch. So, you know, if you were surviving the flames of hell, would you think of, of holding on to a wristwatch receipt? It's, it's pretty incredible, I think. And, um, it looked like she was part of this Gemeindewache, which was a community kind of self-patrolling. Terrorism was supposedly a self-governed, it was a sham operation that was um, uh, pitched by the Nazis to the rest of the world to show how well the Nazis were treating the Jews. And as part of that, um, there was a kind of self-governance uh, structure, and these community watches were part of that, and she apparently was, uh, uh, was, was part of that. The most mysterious thing in this collection is this tiny little shred of mica, Eisenglass, that's used um, back in the day for making windshields and um, things like that, translucent things, aircraft windshields and whatever. I have absolutely no idea what this might be, but it was significant enough that it was saved. So I'm not sure that any amount of uh, research is going to necessarily prove for that. Okay, 
So, I'm wrapping up, probably. Um, one of the, the things about this collection is that there are a lot of single and one-off things, a lot of which, over the course of time, has either accrued a kind of mythology or has no information at all. A lot of the material is, uh, has been given to us with family stories, families trying to fill in the gaps in their history. These histories, these stories, are not necessarily true at all, and oftentimes they're difficult to prove one way or another. I think this is, to some extent, been compounded slightly by a tendency of past Magnus staff to do the best they could with the information they had, and um, sometimes filling in the blanks when, in fact, the blanks probably shouldn't have been filled in at all. But these are a couple of examples. This is a letter from uh, Trotsky, Leon Trotsky in exile. Um, uh, that was in a box with no accession information, no provenance at all. Um, the guy, Ernest Siegel, we've I've done research for and think that by as looking at uh, census records that he was 1901, he was 1982, but I'm not quite sure. This is pretty amazing that he was you know, Trotsky in exile during the Moscow trial. Amazing. This little envelope Here's an example, an interesting example of, um, of, a, of a kind of mythos that accrues around some of these objects that um, may or may not be true, but in almost all cases is incredibly difficult to, to prove one way or another. Um, about a month ago, Julia found a stack of, uh, of, of, what do you call it, of labels for exhibitions for an uh, exhibition at the Magnus in the, in the distant past, or probably up at Russell Street. Uh, looked like it was a Holocaust um, exhibition. And one of these little things, these little labels, said that this Yudish uh, Agrotis house uh, was a book saved from Kristallnacht. So I, of course, immediately went and grabbed this thing, and lo and behold, it's burned. But, you know, it's almost impossible. Do you think this could ever be researched? How would one research it? There are no, no, no way to know. And so, like the burned Torah scroll, which we eventually did get the story uh, straight with, this we may never get straight. So um, I'll end by, by conveying a really cool story. I mean, this is talk about providence. So about a week ago, um, I was at the bottom, inventory at the bottom of virtually the last box that I had to inventory in, in that archival collection. And I got to the bottom and had my Citizen Kane moment, you know? You know, in Citizen Kane, the audience finally learns at the end of the movie what this rose, rosebud that Charles Foster Kane utters this, and it's the, the key to his youth and to everything else. It's his sleigh called Rosebud. Well, I found my Rosebud at the bottom of this box. <laughs> 40 years later, I found the same picture stories from the Bible at the bottom of the glass box. That's it.
presenting a variety of patterns of collecting. I think a lot of these odd things that you have documented it is because people also, as a community effort, drop things off. Yeah. They would leave a bag by the door outside and staff would arrive in the morning and find a bag of things and, and have to figure out what to do with them. Uh, you know, the same way that, you know, sort of like people would abandon babies yeah. or, or something, you know, and that, that same kind of uh, attitude. Um, and so it, 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 there were various ways where things were bought at auction or there were various ways in which materials came in. And it's in a way a story that we still need to be told how this whole collection came to we're, we're still trying to piece it together. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I can't tell you how many phone calls I feel that, that start with, you know, my children don't really want this stuff. Uh, I'm getting old. I don't know exactly what to do with it. It seems too important just to assign to the scrap piece of history. So do you want it? You know? And do you usually say yes? We don't say yes as readily as we used to say yes. Yeah. Um, it, it's not a service to a collection to accept random things that you'll never be, that don't necessarily fit into a pattern of collecting, a, a, a planned pattern of collecting, and then even worse, remember when I was saying I had this story about not being able to catalog something? Even worse is accepting something that you're not going to be able to catalog eventually, or that you're not going to be able to catalog in any time for, in time for somebody to use productively. 